remembered your dad, though. Very oh, yeah. Close. He yeah. knew dad real well. Yeah. Well, when did he play? In, was that the Missouri Valley Conference? Yeah, I think it was. That, then you played for Creighton? Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so he he married your mom in Butte? Well, they, yeah, they eloped. And then they got their marriage blessed. Where'd they elope to? I think it was just in Butte someplace. Oh. But uh, he was, he had a girlfriend that was very pretty, Catholic, Irish, and, you know, fit all the qualifications. I got all kinds of pictures of this lady. One with, with Pat and Fritz Kane, a picture with Grandma Driscoll, a picture with Grandpa Driscoll, a picture with Uncle Bill Driscoll, a picture with Dad. And of course, every other picture is a picture with Dad. And, and it was obvious that she was the gal that was accepted in the family. So what does Dad do? He goes and marries this little Mormon girl that nobody knew, and uh, nobody was really very happy about that. In fact, for a lot of years, she kind of she got, got shut out by the, by the family, but they eventually accepted her. Mm. Mm. And then uh, you got three brothers? Yeah, Jack, my oldest brother, your father, and, and Bill and Bob. They were, each of them was about two years apart. Jack and then Bill and then Bob and then I didn't come along for about five years. I always wondered why my brother Bob didn't like me much. And when Jan, Jan and I visited her brother, who's seven years older than her, I thought he'd run up and hug her and say, God, I missed you. And he came up and he looked at her and he says, you know, I had it made till you came along. <laughs> and I said, that's it. That's why my brother hated my guts. <laughs> of course, we, we, we got to be the best of friends when we got older, but God, he... You know, he never knocked me around or anything like that, but every time I'd open my mouth, he'd put me away. So uh, your dad passed away when you were... I was just 10 years old. And he, and why did he pass away with... Dad had diabetes and uh, he had um, nephritis, which is a kidney. Uh, it was an a uh, injury from the, all the football years he had. Joe Kane told me one time he borrowed this thing that Dad used to wear playing football. It was a leather thing that wrapped around his body, around the kidney area, and what it was is to protect his kidneys. He'd been hurt so many times. When he finished one game down at Creighton with his arm in a, sl in a cast, uh, you know, they didn't they didn't baby those guys in those days. When I tried to go out for football down at Butte High School, Swede Dahlberg had played football with my dad, and I says, is it all right if I go out? And he says, you better go eat some more potatoes, Driss, because I was just a scrawny little bugger. So for the next four years, that's all I heard from Swede. I became the chin up champion of Butte High School, and he'd have the whole football team come in and watch me do chin-ups, and he says, now that's the way you're supposed to do it. And I'd say, can I go out for football now? And he says, you better go eat some more potatoes. Geez, <laughs> <laughs> that used to make me mad. <laughs> but he was a great guy, and he liked me. Uh, he and uh, Jimmy Harris was the assistant principal, and um, Midge Griffith. It was Midge Griffith that got together with my dad, and they're the guys that started the Silver Bees in Butte, which is guys that have, have played football for Butte High 20 years and, and more ago. Mm -hmm. And that's that organization organization is still going, and Dad's the one that wrote the song of the Silver Bees. Hmm. Why did you go to Butte High and not Butte Central? Well, there's there's a number of reasons. Your your dad went there. To and, Butte High. Uh, yeah, to Butte High. Played in the Butte High band, played a tuba. Bill was, uh, everybody thought Bill was going to be a priest. Bill, Bill did go away to the seminary for a couple of years, St. Edward's Seminary, with Sarsfield, so Sullivan and the whole bunch. Uh, Hunthausen, all those guys about that age were at St. Edward's at that time. Bob started at Central High, but Bob was a wise guy. And one day he and Oki O'Connor were sitting there wising off. And Oki is actually the one that made the wisecrack, but the brother turned around and, and thought it was Bob, and he came over. And, uh, you know, the brothers were a little bit rough with, with the students. And he smacked Bob, not hard enough to hurt him all that bad, but he knocked him out of his chair, and his head hit the radiator and knocked him colder than hell. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, after it was all over, well, Bob figured, well, I had it coming to me, but it, except it was Oki's fault in the first place. And Oki told me that in later years. But my 
dad's working on a patient up in his office, and this guy said, Butter, you know, if anybody did that to my kid, I'd break his darn neck. And my dad hadn't heard anything about it. He says, what, what are you talking about? And the guy said, well, didn't you hear what happened to your son? And he told him the story and probably embellished it a little bit. Well, next thing you know, Bob's coming out of the school and here comes my dad in his shirt sleeves. He always wore his white white shirt with no tie and uh, his shirt sleeves rolled up. And he's on his way down there and beat the hell out of the brother. And uh, Bob stopped him. He says, geez, Dad, it's going to make matters worse. Don't do that. He says, I had, I got in trouble because I had it coming to me. And, and, and that's the way the Central students uh, got to thinking about things. You know, if you were... If you weren't too much trouble, you might get slapped on the hand with a leather strap a lot. And if you were a real jerk, uh, you'd get in trouble with the brothers and they'd take you down the handball courts and, and put the gloves on with you. And you'd find out how tough you were then. But anyway, Bob got going again and Dad says, all right, I'm going to let this go on one condition. Next time one of those bastards goes and picks on you or hits you, I want you to hit him back. Well, wouldn't you know, the next guy that hit him was little P.V. Reed, little tiny sawed-off guy. Is it brother? And a brother, yeah. And Bob was wising off again, and the brother came over and slapped him. It was nothing big a deal about it, but Bob thought, well, my dad told me. He stood up and busted him one, knocked him down. And the next thing you know, Dr. Brother Murtaugh, who was the, the principal, come flying in there, and Bob says, you know, that's the first time I went, ever went down a whole flight of steps without touching a step. He said, he threw me, <laughs> give me the bum's rush and threw me right out through the door. And he says, I never went back. So he went to Butte High and he says, now if you want to go down the, there and get the hell kicked out of you all the time, that's up to you. But he said, I wouldn't go there if I were you. So I went, Joe Devich and I were the only ones in, the, in my class out of the Immaculate Conception that, that went to Butte High. And uh, Joe actually talked me into going down there, you know, and I go down there and I'm scared to death and little guy starting this big Butte High School and nobody knows me. Everybody's threatening to give me the holy bowl, which is sticking your head in the toilet and flushing it. And uh, next thing I know, here's uh, Devich getting a, a, a scholarship to Central High and I'm down there all by myself. But by that time I'd started making some friends. And well, I was, was never sorry I well, stayed. What was you? You were ten when your dad died. That was 1943 during the war. Yeah. Now remember now. What was what was Butte like in the in, during the war? Well, you got to figure. You know, as as years pass, while they're passing, you, you have this feeling they're they're going on and on forever. The war is. No, the the years. Oh yeah. You know, you especially when you're a kid, you think God, it's, we're never going to get to next year. When you look back at, at it. And, and look at the way things were crowded together. The end of uh, uh, Prohibition, you got... Uh, what year was that? To 19, around 1931 or 32, I think it was. 1929 stock market crash. You got a town full of people that never had anything or never going to have anything. And nobody re realized that, that they were hard up because everybody else was hard up too. I mean, there wasn't this feeling of somebody else having it all and you didn't have anything. And and so you were happy with it. You were okay with it. And then uh, the hard times that came after the crash and after, you know, during the depression years. Well, I'm a depression baby. It was just, it was really kind of tough. And then this stuff just almost is getting over with in World War. I can remember when they announced the war, we were sitting in our house on, on, on uh, Porphyry Street. didn't have a good heating system. It had a floor furnish like a lot of the houses in, in, in Butte. People, you could always tell if they had a floor furnace because the bottom of their shoes had big squares all over it where they'd been standing on, on the furnace. And um, where was I going with that? Do you remember <laughs> where you were when the war started? Well. We were sitting in the lit in the dining room because that's where the easy chair was, and that's where we listened to the radio all the time. You know, figured there there's no television in those days, and I can remember him announcing the war, and I can remember my dad just uh, he didn't say anything, just sat there. And uh, I think.
think I think he knew, you know, Jack was just the right age. And and my dad, I think we had it in his mind that Jack was gonna go over and get lost. <laughs>